Welcome, everybody, to the Weekly WP Roundup with BJ Keaton. That is me, and every Friday afternoon we go live to talk about all of the best news, tutorials, and resources that we could find this week that was published about WordPress. This is a very interactive show. Uh, I'm already getting comments I'm seeing, so please feel free to uh, throw any comments or questions in the live chat that we've got going, both on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, we're streaming to both of them at the same time. And this is a, like I said, a very interactive show. The community is great, uh, so don't be shy at all. Uh, the Any of the links that we talk about today, and probably more, are in the description of this video. So make sure that you expand that out on the on whichever platform you're on, and you'll be able to see all of the links. Uh, let me apologize in advance because apparently my neighbors are mowing the lawn right now outside my window, and that will hopefully subside uh, very soon, and uh, that noise won't uh, be there much longer. Uh, but I'm seeing from Cyprus and from Iowa and the UK, I'm just seeing a wonderful mix of people here already. It's, uh, it's so, so good to uh, see y'all. Um, so I want to dig in and uh, I want to dig in and tell you that uh, I hope you're wearing sweatpants. Uh, the one of the things I saw this week that really, really stuck with me, and I've been seeing it all week long. So when I saw this WP Tavern article saying that you deserve to wear sweatpants, I absolutely had to read it. I wanted to share with you, and I really wanted to talk to y'all about this because I've seen so much recently about this kind of new work from home etiquette, the idea of professionalism while we're all on quarantine while we're all working from home uh, and whether or not you worked from home before that there is an adjustment here there is an adjustment for culture and I'm seeing that uh, there's a lot of pushback from uh, different groups and different people on what that necessarily means and this article is uh, I mean it's just fantastic it is an opinion piece uh, which I really love these kinds of uh, op-eds to be able to talk about these topics and this one in particular uh, talks about how it's okay 
to be comfortable. And that's one thing I want to actually talk about with y'all. Um, oh, I got, I really got distracted because I didn't actually uh, notice uh, that they made a reference to Huntsville, Alabama in the first uh, paragraph of this as I was looking at it just now. It says, slide into your Rocket City Trash Pandas tee. And that's one, that's our local uh, minor league team over in uh, Huntsville that's opening up. So I was like, hey, uh, so they must be local as well. I'm going to have to contact them and see. Uh, but um, I, like I said, this article talks about like, how there is a differing culture that is really coming to light in all of the Zoom meetings and video conferences that we're having. Uh, probably y'all, as well as pretty much everyone else, is having an increase in the number of face-to-face -face virtual meetings that they're having. Uh, rather than being able to walk into someone's office, now we're getting on a Zoom call. We may be getting on Skype, or we may be uh, making a Slack voice call or FaceTime to somebody. The um, when we do this, there is an expectation here uh, of how we're going to present ourselves, and it changes. And the big thing is that it changes. And like I said, this is the big thing, depending on what kind of call it is and where you are. Um, I saw a, uh, a Twitter thread this uh, maybe it was yesterday that was talking about someone getting an email from their boss because they changed their zoom background into a meme with the guy looking at the uh, the other woman uh, while the girlfriend was was upset uh, and it had the other woman being the lady uh, who was the zoom call and the, it was the boss responding to them saying that, that wasn't professional they expected to see their apartment last the next time and it's like this idea of being put together of what professionalism actually is now uh in our content team meeting this last week i had an animal crossing picture as my background with one of my one of my villagers uh matt had a roller coaster video in the background uh we ended up changing out by the end of the meeting but we were it's a playful atmosphere. We are a more casual culture at ET here. So that kind of thing is okay. We were all joking around with it. Um, and the thing is that that's what this article is about is when is this appropriate to do these kinds of things? Um, so I really wanted to see what y'all's experiences have been so far. Have you gotten ready to uh, have these kinds of meetings? Do you actually get fully dressed for work if you're at home now? Do you put on what you would normally wear to the office for these kinds of calls with your coworkers or clients or whatever? Or are you you know, like a lot of people and like this guy jokes around here, uh, lounging in your baby Yoda sweats in your uh, rocket city trash pandas tee. He actually says later in the article, he's wearing as he writes it, basketball shorts and a sleeveless t-shirt. Um, I'm doing this stream. Uh, I'm doing this stream in my Divi shirt and a pair of active wear, uh, shorts from old Navy. Um, because I'm not going to wear slacks, uh, while sitting here for an hour. It's just that kind of, of thing that everybody does it. And uh, there's a, a time and place. I mean, if you're having a job interview, you dress nicely. My wife got ready the other morning for a staff meeting and put on makeup and uh, had on a nice blouse to sit there rather uh, to put herself together. But it was something she felt that made her feel better rather than something that was expected of her by her coworkers. Um, and so I think it's... Uh, it's a very interesting thing uh, that different people approach this differently, um, and I wanted to kind of uh, I wanted to kind of, of get your responses to this and get what y'all uh, are thinking about it and how you you've had this come up so far if you've had this come up uh, at all. Um, I'm looking through here. I see Uncle Social says he's wearing a tux because it's after six. What is he, a farmer? Uh, I would expect nothing less. Um, Mike says, I put on a decent shirt for Zoom meetings. Yeah, I uh, totally, absolutely uh, get that. George is a freelancer, so he doesn't care what companies do. Um, 
Rob uh, O'Mara says, having them all the time, it helps to keep a routine. So I get up, keep the same morning routine routine as if I was going to work. That helps a great deal, I know, for uh, my boss, for Nathan. Uh, talks about having a routine of going for a walk, uh, like it's a commute, that kind of thing. It's uh, very, very helpful. Steven right now is in a t-shirt and sweats in California. Uh, and uh, Uncle Social says, I've dressed for a... I've always worked from home and dressed for the day early, dressed for the job you want to have after all. Uh, but then again, he's a rather stiff Brit. Um, and I do think that has something to do with it as well, depending on uh, where you are in the world and what's expected of you. Um, one thing, like for, for me in America, that kind of thing is really in flux. I used to wear hoodies to work hoodies and jeans to work when I ran a learning center because the students found it less intimidating to come talk to me when I dressed more casually than if I was in the suit and tie that I'd worn previously. It was, it's very interesting to see how this goes. I see Rob says that uh, he has to admit that his virtual background may have been an Animal Crossing wallpaper a few times. Uh, cheers to that. Uh, Karen is in PJs all day, the mid-afternoon shower before and after a nap. That sounds fantastic, Karen. Um, and uh, Judy has a perfectly pristine white wall for a background, dresses very plainly so as not to distract from her amazing eyes, uh, which are usually looking at the straight screen instead of the camera. Uh, I cannot uh, say how much I understand that. It was very, very hard when I first started doing these streams to look directly into the camera and talk to y'all, uh, as opposed to looking at the comments and actually just, you know, speaking directly at the uh, screen like this, because that's where I'm actually seeing the interaction. While I look over back and forth, I've had to train myself to look directly at the camera. And in Zoom meetings, that kind of thing is really helpful as well. Uh, but yeah, so this is just kind of a, uh, a conversation piece that I saw that's talking about what uh, we can do, the idea of what's expected, uh, how we're adjusting to it, and what the new normal is going to be. Uh, because like I used to, like I said, I used, I used to be a teacher. I used to wear suits and ties, and uh, then I became a little more lax. I interacted with students on a personal basis in the, the center, uh, and then eventually, you know, working from home where I'm in pajamas most of the time and rarely get dressed for work other than maybe changing into a new pair of clean pajamas, things like that. Um, I understand why people are uh, falling into the uh, not taking care of themselves. And that there's a big difference here uh, in taking care of yourself uh, and uh, not taking care of yourself rather and uh, having to be dolled up wearing, you know, business casual all the time when you're sitting in front of your computer uh, and taking a call every now and then. But anyway, just wanted to uh, bring this up. I thought it was a very interesting piece. I think y'all should read it all uh, because the, uh, the, what brought it up was a guy from the uh, L.A. Times, uh, Adam Shorn, who uh, said uh, that, uh, let's see, where is the actual the lead here? Um, and start our work days looking like we deserve the paychecks we're lucky enough to be earning, uh, which is understandable. Uh, but at the same time, they're, we're not earning that by our pretty, by our pretty good looks, uh, pretty faces, unless we're in a very specific line of work. So, uh, unless you're modeling, I think you can wear sweatpants y'all. Uh, but that's just me. Anyway, uh, looking at the comments here, um, I see, uh, okay. Asks, uh, is there any chance of feature update on WooCommerce checkout cart login and sign up module designs and customization? And as far as I know, it's coming soon. Um, that is in, as far as I know, uh, that may be included in the upcoming WooCommerce updates. We're doing a version two of them. I guess I shouldn't say version two. I guess I should say volume two of uh, additional modules. And uh, you can look for more customization options then. I don't have an ETA on that, but I know that they're uh, in the pipeline of the ones closest to the top at being released. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, I, I'll mispronounce this. So I, I apologize. Uh, Sinal says, hi from Turkey. I think working at home will be hard uh, to get used to which people uh, want to work. Most want to work. Uh, yeah. The And you're going to be working from home soon. So uh, I don't know. 
whether or not that's a good thing, congratulations on being able to work from home. Uh, I hope you find it as wonderful as I do and freeing, really, as I do. Um, if you're excited to work from home, I guess that is a good thing. Um, and it is it does show that when you're working from home and working remotely, it will affect productivity up and down. Uh, be prepared probably for a small spike in productivity at first, uh, then a fairly steep drop in productivity as you figure out your routine, and then uh, coming up again uh, and plateauing when you get learned to work. But you're absolutely right. You can, uh, uh, you can see which people most want to work uh, by the way that that kind of spike... Ooh, that kind of spike and, uh, you know, drop and uh, then leveling off uh, actually happens. Um, and uh, I see Judy says someone needs to invent a monitor that has a camera that captures uh, the screen from behind between the pixels, so to speak. That would be really cool. I would uh, uh, love love something like that where they, we could look directly at the screen and not do that. You could do it potentially with mirrors and the way that if the camera was doing that, I'm, I'm sure there is a way that's way more complicated than someone like me would be able to think of because I was thinking like refracting it and, and uh, having to take different angles of it for stereoscopic images. Um, but yeah, so uh, that was, I don't want to say it was my, uh, my soapbox, but it was a very interesting idea uh, since I've seen it come up so much this week. And even, you know, like I said, here in my own house, I asked my wife, uh, I was like, why are you getting dressed for your uh, meeting today? Like she had an 845 meeting on Monday and I was like, why are you getting all dolled up like you're going to work? And uh, because she wasn't, she's like, oh, I just want to feel good. I'm, I'm you know, this is, I'm going to see the, my coworkers. I, I want to look nice. And like, I get that. That's great. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to, uh, to talk about that. Now, the second thing that I put under news ties into another one of the articles down in the resources. Um, if you look at the first one under resources in the video description here, um, it's called what is COBOL and should you learn it? Um, this is a code newbie podcast talking about, uh, COBOL, the uh, like 60 year old uh, programming language, I think it was 1959 that it came out. Um, and uh, that many of you who have been coding for years and years um, have probably run across and uh, written some stuff in before. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, podcast. I think that you, uh, y'all should definitely listen. I love the Code Newbie podcast. Um, and then, uh, but this article in the news was something that I, I wanted to bring this because it came up in an email from Medium to me. Uh, and when I clicked in it and read it, I thought it brought up some really fantastic points for things that are going on right now. And one of the topics that all of us have talked about um, is that uh, we're having to change the way that we're doing business. Um, that a lot of us are. That we're, made, we're having to pivot onto different ideas of what services we can offer. We're having to maybe look uh, new avenues for clients, things like that. So... The title of this article, and the reason it's a really good title, our government runs on a 60-year-old coding language, and now it's falling apart. Um, it is a very misleading title as well, um, headlines. So that's why I wanted to talk about it, because you know it's in the line of what we've talked about over the past few weeks with all this. Um, our government, meaning uh, the United States government, it's written by an American, um, and now it's falling apart. It's actually referring to the country rather than the programming language. Uh, like I said, very, very sneaky headline. But what it's talking about is that a lot of our financial systems are written in COBOL. That we, uh, uh, see Uncle Social says this, the old legacy banks in the UK still have a lot of COBOL in their systems. Um, it's lucky we have a great surge of new and challenger banks in the UK that have been built from scratch. And that's one of the things that it's talking about in this article, Uncle Social, is that uh, lots and lots of the banks in America still as well have COBOL as a major proponent of their uh, infrastructure. And as we are getting hit with all of this new financial mess that we're in, they don't have anyone on staff who necessarily knows COBOL. Think about that. Think about our, all of our, you know, money's imaginary anyway, but think of this whole system right now of uh, being run on this and we don't have people who can program it. 
But you said legacy banks, and that's the thing. I hate, I, I, I like and hate the word legacy, but this is actually bringing a lot of veteran programmers who have been doing this for decades kind of back into the spotlight. People who were, you know, coding in COBOL and Fortran in the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s are now actually getting new contracts, government contracts, to make sure that everything is going to keep running. And uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up to y'all was because I know that some of y'all have been doing this for that long. I mean, I was in high school and I started learning COBOL and Fortran. Um, did not like COBOL. Don't get me wrong. I did not like it and did not learn. I learned Fortran 77 a lot deeper than I did uh, COBOL. But it's people who've been doing this for decades who, uh, my gosh, I was thinking about that just to, to stop myself there. That was 22 years ago when I started learning how to do that, like almost 23. Like, that's crazy. That's really, uh, really crazy to me that it was that long ago that I started looking at COBOL and Fortran. Terrifying, right? Uh, so, uh, but that's the kind of people who are getting these new government contracts. If you're one of these people, if you have these skills to do this, look into that. Um, it's not that Fortran itself is, or uh, COBOL itself is bad or outdated or anything. There was a new update. This uh, The people in the comments were talking about this on Medium about being updated in 2014 with new syntax working on modern hardware uh, that it's not uh, absolutely uh, not outdated or... Uh, anything at all like they're making it out to be um it is uh something that i know a lot of y'all might want to look into and that's why i put it in the news because it's something that i think is newsworthy that people who have been doing this for a long time have a new opportunity to get into that uh and younger people and i do and i do uh mean younger people in uh, in terms of those who may not have uh, started out your programming uh in something like cobol or uh q basic or c uh you might think about learning this it's a not i don't want to say that it's not a hard language to learn but it is a straightforward language with a very uh, human-like syntax. It's very like Ruby in that way, at least in that way. And uh, it's something that uh, if you're already a developer and know any kind of coding language that you could probably pick up uh, once you learn its logic. And it is uh, the, uh, it's very, I've lost the word that I was looking for. It could do uh, do you very well to look into uh, doing that right now because there's going to be a demand for this uh, as we need to update our systems. Uh, and I see um, Karen says, uh, anyone ever use assembler? I started way back in the day. I have messed around with assembly language. I have not ever done anything that would even compile and run. Um, and uh, Rob says, oh, I don't think I actually used it, but it did break me. There it is. <laughs> um, uh, and Karen, punch cards, or started with punch cards. Didn't I have not used punch cards. That is one. Uh, I've never had the opportunity to actually learn how punch cards work, but I'm fascinated whenever I see a documentary uh, looking back and having footage of them being fed into the machines. Like, I'm, I'm fascinated by the technology. Um, the, uh, but, uh, yeah, so... Very interesting things this week, I thought. Like, like these are not the kinds of, of news that are like, hey, there's this new cool thing that's going on. But it's like, these are some really interesting thoughts. Uh, Thought-provoking pieces that, that might help somebody. And that's really the point of this whole... Uh, this whole, uh, this whole thing here. Um, I see Karen said, uh, regarding the punch cards, you didn't want to drop your deck. Oh no, <laughs> I would have done that so many times. Just thinking about that right now. Like I'd never, never once have I thought about dropping the deck of punch cards. And I can't even imagine the panic with somebody who's uh, as butterfingered as I am. Like, I drop stuff all the time. Like, I actually do. Like, that's not even me saying. It's like I just I have very little manual dexterity. Um, so it's really funny to think about that. 
Um, uh, Michael started with uh, first Commodore 64 and uh, BASIC. Uh, Daryl used BASIC on several uh, TRS-80 systems uh, with color computers, models 3 and 4. Uh, that's awesome. I love learning this stuff. This is this is one of my favorite things uh, that I love I love hearing what people have started with because it's uh, and how you got here. <laughs> um, I see uh, Uncle Social is now basic printing. I love Divi and on repeat over and over again. So thank you for that. Uh, there are very few things about basic that I uh, I remember, but that one I do. Man, go to lines right? Not man. Um. Sorry, I'm reading the comments and I'm seeing a subs uh, Rob talking about a subscription to Rainbow Magazine. Uh, that one, I don't know. Somehow that one has missed uh, all, like, completely, like, skirted around my uh, my knowledge. So I'm looking at that. That looks really cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking that up uh, after I get done here. Um, I love you guys, by the way. Just so you know, that this kind of conversation about all of it makes me really happy. Uh, I love seeing everybody have these kind of talks and get to know each other. Um, that, uh, but yeah, continue, continue that. I'm going to move forward a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that is just super interesting to me that uh, y'all might have that kind of uh, expertise and can be go and maybe go through refreshers, get some new contracts, uh, reach out and see. Um, now, the tutorials that I put in this week um, are different, uh, not different than usual, but I did highlight a few things that I wanted uh, y'all to, to see, uh, specifically that Donetta has been doing an amazing job, um, an absolutely amazing job on getting header and footer designs in her tutorials that match our layout packs and that you can learn how to do yourself through the theme builder. Um, I know that this has been a much requested feature. I know last week we were talking about it. Someone actually requested it uh, last week and was talking about it. So I've got two of them in uh, the tutorial section at the very top where you can see the download a free minimal header and footer combo uh, made with Divi's theme builder and then get a free global header and footer template for Divi's uh, influencer layout pack. Um, that was, um, uh, those are beautiful. Um, I know that these are very similar uh, in the way that they're used that uh, our Black Friday headers and footers were, where you can import them in uh, and use them as you want on any kind of theme builder pages and be able to customize them uh, like you need to, but they're pre-built. Um, and this shows you how to build them as well with the tutorials like we always do. So I wanted to let y'all know that it is on there. We've listened. We want to get this stuff out to you. And uh, really kudos to Donetta for being able to put this stuff together uh, with her uh, wizardry uh, that we all uh, know and love and uh, uh, just really uh, champion this and push it forward. Um, also, um, oh, I see some uh, comments. Uh Oh, Daryl says that Rainbow Magazine was uh, geared specifically for the color computers from Radio Shack. Awesome. I am totally reading up on that. Now, Sarah has a, uh, a comment on, can I change subjects as per the tutorial on scroll? Yes, absolutely. Uh, do the new scroll effects affect page speed? Um, I've tried them, and in the mobile version, it seemed to slow it down. Um Uncle Social asked what slowed it down. Was it the page load speed or was it stuttering in the browser when scrolled? That was going to be my next thing. Uh, just wondering if the effect is straining the computer or mobile device. That, I've not run into any issues with it. Um, on the machines that I've used on my uh, desktop PC over here and the MacBook that I'm on right now here, I've not uh, actually run into any stuttering issues. Um, I've not had it where when I load, uh, I've had problems loading it up. Um, I tend to try to keep, uh, when I you do that uh, on the demo sites that I've run it on and even the production sites I've done them in, um, tend to have them very lightweight pages without a whole lot going on in terms of scripts that are being loaded. So I can't say that it doesn't. Um, but for me, no. But that has been on full desktop. I honestly 
can't think of a time that I've loaded it up on mobile. Um, it could be the machine. It could be the number of uh, things that are being held in the cache right then. Um, and it could be, uh, it could be, I don't know enough about that. Like I said, my personal experience is no, it hasn't. Um, but I know that if it is, uh, there is probably something on the page interacting with it in some way or another uh, that is causing a uh, the computer or browser most likely to uh, bottleneck, really, to run the, the heavy scripts at the same time. Um, I would check that, see what external scripts you're pulling in and calling, uh, and uh, what order you're running scripts. If you have your scripts put in the footer rather than the header, uh, please do that. Like it is much, uh, much better in terms of page load, uh, to do that. And it might affect this as well. Um, the, uh, yeah. And uncle social says, share the link with a family member or friend to get them to test on their device. Always good. Uh, if you don't have other devices just sitting around, uh, to do that testing on, um, try it in different browsers. I always try it in Chrome, Firefox and Safari. Um, I don't bother with Microsoft Edge because it I don't honestly remember that it exists most of the time. And uh, also, Uncle Social mentions the uh, Elegant Themes live chat support could take a look. Um, remember, and this is for everybody out there uh, to talk about support, we offer, and a lot of people do take advantage of this, so that's why I, I say that. Um, we have the ability through secure tokens, uh, and your API key to be able to log in basically and get remote access uh, to your site when you allow it, uh, just direct from us to you to be able to look and see what on the back end of your site could be going wrong with what you're having it. So if you log in uh, to our support, uh, tell them what's going on and see if they can actually find uh, something that might be slowing it down. Uh, that may be a known issue or something that they know, uh, can clog it up like that. Um, I've, excuse me, I've uh, known that to save a lot of people's time, uh, just being able to, yeah, they're in my back end fixing it right now uh, kind of thing, which is better in so many ways than uh, taking screenshots, pointing it out, sharing log files back and forth. Uh, the getting them actually into your site, getting the support team on there is uh, absolutely uh a godsend in a lot of ways because it has uh, changed the way that we've been able to do support. And I think it's a very good thing specifically for uh, times like this. I was going to say ideas like this, uh, specifically for issues like this that come up where it might be specific on uh, what is causing that kind of stuttering. I do try to limit as well. Just and this is this is for every site I make with everything I've ever made Divi, Elementor, uh, Visual Studio, a uh, Visual Composer, rather Visual Studio is different. Um, I try to limit the number of animations I have per page. So if I generally have a scroll effect, that may be the only animation that I'll have on that page where it's not trying to pull a second animation at the same time as I'm scrolling. Uh, so I wouldn't have a module uh, slide in uh, animation set through the module um, as I have a section animation uh, set on scroll. Um, that That's just my personal way of doing things though, but that might play into why I am having uh, not having those issues uh, personally. Uh, so if there's some kind of uh, extraneous, uh, superfluous, superfluous is the word I was looking for, superfluous uh, animations on there uh, that aren't you know, adding anything as much as the scroll animation, try turning those off and seeing if that helps. Um, Uncle Social says, I have way too many tabs open, world community grid running in two monitors. Sometimes BJ ends up stuttering like Max Headroom. Um, that is something I used to go to speech therapy for, uh, Uncle Social. So thank you very much. It's not your computer. Um, but no, really, I did. I did. I do get a stutter when I get very excited. So there are probably occasions where it happens and it's not your computer. Um, but yeah, Sarah, if you have so many animations and options and you go overboard, uh, check that out. Uh, try cutting individual module animations off. 
Um, like I've turned off, uh, I remember one that I was doing a scroll. I wanted the blog modules to, uh, kind of pop up on animate, uh, so, or on scroll rather. So I scrolled down to get that. But what I also had was a couple of, uh, side text modules that were coming in with different bullets, uh, where I had them animating coming in basically at the same, like just before the, uh, blog, the blog module came up. So I would scroll, the page would load, the uh, stuff as they started to move uh, would launch the module as they went down and that would start coming in. Then they scrolled just beyond it and the animation on the blog module would pop in because it was on scroll and that uh, kind of overloaded the page on everything and I've ripped uh, animations like that before. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm an overloader like that too. And I've had to learn over, uh, the past couple of years to be as, uh, singularly focused as possible. Um, kind of, uh, kind of, you know, one particular effect per page. So as not to overwhelm the user and, <laughs> and the browser, I guess at this point, uh, the browser and the browser, uh, see, uh, uh, I'm so sorry for that one. Um, but, uh, Y'all also asked uh, last week for uh, specific page templates. Y'all talked about uh, like blog post templates and things like that. Um, we have a how to create an author page template with uh, Divi's Theme Builder, which is basically the same thing as the uh, what y'all were asking for. This is for a page rather than a post. Excuse me. But this is possible to, you know, put in a content with, uh, you know, the, the relevant content uh, with the module and as you need to like that. It's really cool. But that this is just a really beautiful one by Arana uh, with the uh, bio, the, the headshot, the uh, different posts and work that the author has done. It's absolutely beautiful. But I also wanted to give y'all an update where y'all had mentioned these new kinds of blog, uh, getting blog post templates for the theme builder. Uh, and uh, Jason and Donietta brought that up independently uh, themselves when we were discussing things this week. So uh, that is, uh, I see the stutter came out. I have no idea what the uh, will come of that, but I did uh, reiterate and reinforce that that's something that y'all have talked about multiple times and uh, that uh, that the community wants and needs. Uh, so they've already thought about it. They're thinking of things to do. So uh, y'all can look forward to those hopefully in the future. But it was, like I said, it was brought up this week and I wanted to tell you guys. No clue when that'll be coming out, but uh, but I wanted to let you know that uh, that we talked about it. Um, so this one is a tutorial that we published. I got quite a few tutorials we published this week on here uh, because there are things that I wanted to talk to y'all specifically about uh, for one reason or another. And the fourth one down is how to use Twitter trending hashtags for marketing without looking like spam because you can really get ignored on Twitter, get a bad reputation and, uh, you know, actually get, uh, reported as spam. If you try to take over trending hashtags, we using irrelevant content. And so this is a way to look at trending hashtags, uh, by creating content that fits in with it, that, uh, still promotes your brand or business, uh, may maybe not necessarily even a product or service, but helps promote, uh, what, you know, you as a company or you as a person. And I brought this up specifically, uh, like I said, it's specifically for y'all because I had the idea to, uh, pitch this topic because of uncle social, uh, way back, like two years ago when we started this thing. Uh, and thank you for being such a loyal viewer, uncle social, uh, the loyal viewer and friend. Um, and, he mentioned that when he was doing marketing, he would create graphics for Twitter hashtags uh, that ended up uh, dealing with the topic, uh, but would just get out there and just enter the conversation using them. And, you know, as we've been moving this, looking at pitches for ideas for the blog, uh, I thought of this one and thought of you. So uh, I wanted to uh, give you a shout out for uh, for being my muse on that one uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night, but I can remember stuff like that. Um, but, oh, yeah, I do remember what I had for dinner last night. Um, 
But yeah, uh, just wanted to tell y'all thank you, tell you thank you for that. And uh, it's a good article as well, so you should probably check it out. Um, that said, the last one that I put in that we did uh, this week was uh, how to use absolute positioned image modules as zoom out parallax backgrounds with Divi. Um, parallax is kind of a pain sometimes to get it to do exactly what you want it to do. Um, I know that there are issues with the uh, parallax that comes with some of the backgrounds uh, that we've had uh, in different sections. I know that that's being worked on. Uh, so when this one came out to be able to use uh, backgrounds using image modules uh, to zoom in and out on them uh, for parallax, had to show you how to do this. Uh, this was, uh, I think it was Jason who did this one. I'm clicking in to make sure. Uh, nope, this one was Donetta. Um That uh, when you're doing this one uh, that has the zoom in and zoom out uh, on scroll here uh, to make it look like parallax, to act as though it's parallax, it looks really, really cool. I think y'all could uh, could see that. Um, and yeah, Sarah, the, uh, Sarah says on YouTube, the image becomes huge when you parallax it. It's frustrating. Yes, yes. I have had so many images that I've thought were just perfect for parallax before. And when I put it in the, this is my putting it in the website uh, hand uh, that I do. When I put it on the website, it just took up way too much space. It did not look like I expected it to. And so maybe this is, a, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a way to fix that because you're specifically uh, placing the image modules and working with the zoom to, uh, to get it as a background. So um, hopefully this will help fix some of those uh, issues that, that you, know, you and I both had with it becoming gigantic. Um, that said, uh, moving forward, uh, hopefully that will help you. Uh, I had last week, I believe, someone had mentioned streaming software, and we were talking about what I used uh, using OBS uh, right now. Um, we had... Um, we had some issues, not issues, excuse me. We had a conversation uh, shortly after that. It was the beginning of this week talking about updating our uh, streaming software, like not actually going to a different service, but the uh, going into um, like actually updating whether we want to put the new versions of the software on our computer. And it has been a long time since I've updated OBS because I am afraid of updating something when it works. And uh, so when that, with that in mind, when I saw that uh, Joe Casabona, again, terrible pronouncing names, um, put out a how to find the right recording and streaming software, had to link to this because he talks about uh, things like ScreenFlow, talks about Ecamm Live, which is great. If y'all have not ever tried Ecamm, Ecamm is a fantastic company that makes a Skype call recorder and Ecamm Live, which is very simple to use uh, streaming software. So if y'all are looking to get into that and do any kind of uh, calls, podcasting, live streaming, especially right now while we're all at home, those are very good ones to check out, as well as OBS that I'm using here uh, and a few others that he talks about. Like I said, this is one that came from a conversation uh, I wanted to include and talk about because it came from a conversation that we had had on here uh, because I think a lot of people are looking for that kind of thing. Um, uh, and so, excuse me, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but it's uh, definitely, uh, there are a lot of choices out there and it's hard, it's easy to get when you're looking at streaming, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the shiny things that do all of the stuff that you think you might need when something like OBS or Ecamm, where you can press a couple of buttons, set a couple of uh, lower thirds and be done with it really work. Uh, it train of thought just completely left how I was going to finish that sentence, but uh, that may be all you need. And that's why I think that like his suggestions are very good and worth checking out. Um, I will also suggest uh, Camtasia on top of that. If you're looking for any kind of webinar or recording software, um, it is great. It's like snag. It's made by the same people, except it's for video. Um, Uncle Social says uh, in terms of uh, graphics for social days. Uh, he says hashtag social days are a great way to practice design and an easy subject uh, 
to create content for, but he's been too busy to do it for my own brand this year. Uh, but you can see, as you can see on the Uncle Social Insta, um, it is uh, hard to do that. You're right. It takes time to do it. But if you have it within your uh, marketing budget to, to budget that time, absolutely uh, can help. Um, and Michael asks, what the best image size is for Parallax? And, ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, I have personally done it at about 1920 uh, by 1280 is what I've traditionally kept. And it's probably not the best uh, to say that. Uh, I say that because of uh, image size and loading. Um, I've made sure to have it compressed using all of the different... Um, like plugins like Tiny Ping and uh, Optim or uh, Imagify and Smush, uh, but I've always used those. And uh, when I've used smaller ones, the reason I use them at that width is because of what Sarah mentioned at making them big, because I thought that it would be the perfect size for it. And what happened was it stretched the image out uh, to where it would fill out the entire thing and be able to parallax more when the image itself didn't need to be. So I've learned to use, I've started using like the 1920 uh, by 1280 if I want one to be in a parallax section that takes up about half the screen uh, so that I can position it up and down uh, and still get the parallax without having to worry about the uh, the horrible zoom that happens sometimes. Um, like I said, probably not ideal in terms of page speed, but in terms of functionality that I've actually been able to get it to do the parallax I wanted to, um, 1800 to 2000 is what has uh, worked to me in terms of width. Um, and Uncle Social says, uh, quote, afraid to update something when it works. <laughs> That's definitely an age thing. Uh, I used to love being on the bleeding edge, and I'd routinely use beta and alpha software, and now I just want it to work. Yes, yes. Um, I will still use uh, beta software in production on production sites and in production uh, environments sometimes. Things like the Gutenberg plugin, I'm A-OK -okay with using on a, a site. But when I'm using a beta anything for something that is actually going out to the public or is going to make something uh, front-facing, I always have a backup. That whenever I'm doing that, I will always have a uh, backup plan for it. The same if I'm using the new version of an existing software. Uh, like when we were using Wirecast for this, when a new update came out uh, that messed it up, we basically just started using our backup of OBS all the time. Uh, that's how I actually found uh, Ecamm was as backup for Wirecast. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, when new versions, things like that. So, so yeah. Um, Moving forward uh, a little bit, I want to move uh, move on down. Um, again, last week we were talking about child themes, or maybe it was the week before, I don't remember. Uh, near the bottom of the tutorial section, at least, uh, there is how to create and customize a WordPress child theme. This is a very in-depth uh, Torque Mag article that talks about the reasons that all the reasons that you want a child theme and uh, all the ways to do it. Uh, it is not a hard process to do. There are very easy plugins and and uh, like down like generators. That's the word. Uh, generators like Divi Spaces to do. Uh, child themes and the Orbisius uh, plugin and tons of other child theme creators. But this is the, it shows the manual way to do it, and I think that y'all uh, should be aware of it because we do at Elegant Themes highly recommend the use of child themes. Uh, it will erase any customization that you have in terms of functionality. Uh, we do have it where you know CSS updates and uh, various things in Divi and customizations that you make won't be overwritten uh, when Divi updates. But if you make major functionality upgrades on your own, uh, those need to be done in a child theme. Uh, any major changes at all need to be done in a child theme. Um, if you're not running a child theme, uh, you do risk losing that work on updates and you risk uh, breaking the site if something doesn't work uh, where you might have to restore from a backup rather than yanking a single file out of a folder and having everything be hunky-dory again. Um, just that alone is worth using a child theme for and taking the extra time. Um, that 
Also, uh, that said, moving on into uh, the very last one under uh, the tutorials is a WP Beginner article that I just thought was uh, an interesting topic that I wanted to point out to y'all during this period on how to schedule coupons in WooCommerce. Uh, it's just an idea that y'all can, uh, can kind of run with and uh, really uh, maybe help a client out with uh, by getting them uh, some scheduled coupons to go out to their, uh, to their customers. Sorry, excuse me. Um, now, it's been a few weeks since I've been able to get to the resources section. I'm kind of proud that, uh, that I've made it down here, but also uh, feel free to throw anything else in the comments that you want. Um, uh, as well, that uh, the resources are generally, like I've uh, said in the past, are the things that's like, oh, that's neat. I should share that on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, that's what I consider resources, the stuff that can enlighten you and, and really uh, make it uh, make your life a little bit better. And yes, Daryl, <laughs> uh, yep, me getting to resources today means that you're slacking on comments. So uh, so I'm expecting some uh, some chit chat now, folks, get on it. Um, but like I said earlier, the COBOL podcast from Code Newbie is the first one because it is very relevant right now and uh, very interesting. I just love Saran as a as a host. Uh, Code Newbie is great. Cannot cannot recommend it enough. Uh, it really gave me this podcast gave me um, excuse me uh, gave me the confidence of being able to move out of academics and into the uh, the web dev uh, and you know tech sector here because it uh, really approach shows how people uh, can very easily approach this kind of industry. So if you're on there, if you're on uh, excuse me, if you are on in the audience and you are on the fence about whether or not you can or should uh, do this, uh, whether or not you're able to to make it into uh, this industry and whether you're too old. Uh, I've seen that one a couple of times, whether you have the skills, whether it's too late to learn, whatever it is, listen to Code Newbie. This You will absolutely get inspired and know that you can do this. Uh, that's why I included this one about COBOL on here. Um, Gary on uh, Facebook asked, can Divi access pods uh, custom fields? If so, how, please? I've not used pods, but I'm going to put that, um, I'm going to put that out to the uh, comments on YouTube uh, specifically and for Facebook as well. I just know we tend to have more uh, folks on YouTube uh, at any given time commenting. Um who use pods for the custom fields because I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm sure someone has figured it out out there, uh, but if anybody can pop over to Facebook or, or pop it in the comments here so that I can uh, let him know how to do the uh, do pods custom fields with uh, Divi, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, and Gary, if you uh, if that doesn't come up with, if someone doesn't know the answer, uh, that would actually be a very good question for the live chat uh, because if there is a way to access it, they should have uh, a solution uh, on there that they've used before so they can tell you that uh, because I honestly don't know uh, how to do that. I apologize for that. Um, 147 Dev uh, asks, what plugins would you recommend to help a restaurant do online booking and deliveries? I like Bookly personally. It's one that I've used uh, a couple of times in the past for uh, clients. Uh, it's a premium. Uh, it's a premium plugin. It does uh, good things. It's been very robust in terms of what they were doing uh, with my friend's uh, vent company, uh, where they were able to schedule all of their workers, schedule things out. Um, that one uh, has been very, very good for online booking and deliveries, like scheduling uh, stuff like that. Um, I think there was one last week actually about deliveries. Um, find it. Yes. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste uh, this one for you. Uh, 147. This was uh, one. I'm going to paste this in Facebook as well, y'all, uh, on, uh, how to create, uh, an, uh, online ordering system for restaurants, uh, was specifically what this one was called. Uh, so, uh, there will be some, uh, resources in that one as well. Very, very high demand 
project right now um, that uh, that people are needing online uh, deliveries uh, very very badly uh, because of you know we talked last week about DoorDash and things like that and people removing themselves from those services uh, and this article uh, from last week you can also go find the discussion that we had on that last week in the archives on YouTube or Facebook uh, of you know of elegant themes here where we were talking about it but uh, that article uh, breaks it down um, what to use uh, and shows you you know step by step through it uh, I like I said I'm gonna I'm gonna take this time to reiterate if you are looking for client work think about reaching out to local businesses local restaurants things like this to do stuff like uh, online ordering uh, websites menu updates stuff like that that they may be uh, looking for um, Sarah uh, it should um, for the most part a lot of these uh, are interchangeable with different industries uh, to be able to uh, to just do uh, scheduling uh, for hair salon stuff I have uh, seen I would I know bookly would work for that because of the same kind of thing that my event people would uh, work uh, would work with um, ev the event calendar would work and there's one called uh, I did a I did an article on it a couple of years ago uh, the CETA uh, trying to find the name of the calendar that they use. Uh, working on it right now, trying to find this because I can't. I know I. Uh, I'm gonna post this one as well. Uh, in the comments here, uh, VCDA had a very good uh, WordPress plugin uh, for scheduling appointments uh, that was very, very slick and smooth. That would be good for hair, uh, not specifically for hair salons, but it would definitely work for it given the kinds of things, the uh, kinds of repeat businesses uh, and appointments that it was set up for. It, uh, uh, I know it when I did it was set up specifically for users to pick their own times uh, in the VC to uh, a plug-in where they could set their own times and it would be able to be set up as a repeat appointment, uh, things like that for like spas and things like that. So yeah, absolutely, it would work for hair salons. Uh, Daryl suggests Amelia for hair salons for anybody who's not following the comments uh, on YouTube. Uh, so I, that's a new one on me. And so once again, Daryl, you know the drill. Um, <laughs> A media booking, uh, so that I can, <laughs> so that I can uh, look into it and learn about it. Um, that uh, I, I absolutely uh, love learning about new new pieces of software uh, like that. And Amelia, I I really like appointment and event plugins actually as well because they can be used for so many different things. Um, uh, love G appointments. It works with Gravity Forms for scheduling. Thanks, Christine. Uh, that's a, another one that I haven't uh, run across uh, just personally. So great G appointments. New tab G appointments. Uh, doing that one. Um, and Dominic uh, on Facebook asks, is there an easier way to make your site responsive without having to keep going into tablet and mobile view, mobile view and making alterations? Not right now. There is an update scheduled to come out on uh, being able to set your own breakpoints where uh, you'll be able to determine when those uh, the site shifts into the more responsive part. Uh, so you could say that you keep the desktop uh, site on uh, until you get down to like a 400 width uh, device. You can do that soon. Uh, that'll be coming. I'm not sure when that's actually going to be uh be designed or uh, be released, but it's being designed and worked on and developed right now. Um, there is an article actually, I think in the resources here. Uh, yes. The very last thing on the list, Dominic, uh, is a Divi responsive helper plugin, a review uh, that Divi cake uh, put up uh, that might be able to help you as well. It's a third party one uh, that they review and look at. So, 
That is specifically uh, a plugin that does what you want to do with Divi. Uh, so check it out and see if maybe that would help. I haven't used it, don't know anything about it other than I saw that and thought that would probably help somebody. And uh, so hopefully it will help you. Um, she appointments, da, 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 reading, reading, reading. Uh, and uh, Jay Mueller asks, uh, again, sorry I cannot pronounce umlauts very well. Um, Mueller, Mueller, Mueller. Uh, let's see, have you some secret tips for beating up my Divi site? Um, if they were secret tips, I would, uh, no. Um, no, I don't have any secret tips. The best thing that I do is uh, keep sc external scripts to a minimum images sized to the point that you need them to be sized to. Don't throw a 1920 uh, image on something that you need an 880 image for and have CSS resize it. Just uh, use the size of the image that you need. That helps a lot. It keeps an extra, uh, it's one extra process that uh, doesn't have to be, uh, be performed. Things like that, making sure that you use an image optimization plugin, uh, making sure that you uh, listen to the things that GT Metrics and uh, Pingdom tell you. Uh, try to keep uh, just everything uh, as as clean and bare as possible. Uh, you can absolutely get uh, pages in uh, running in under a second with Divi. I've done it a uh, number of times. It just takes uh, playing to see it, well, it takes some playing with to see what it actually is actually slowing down that site. And almost in exclusively, uh, most of it comes from images for me and then external scripts being uh, run. So try to keep those to a minimum. Um, And yes, a caching plugin, Uncle Social says, does help a great deal. Um, WP Rocket is the fastest one that I've found. W3 Super Cache, W3 Fastest Cache, and WP Super Cache have also done really, really, really good things for me. Uh, the ones that I've used. Um, and uh, Mitchell Craver asks, are there any good videos that are not two to three hours long that go through the basic steps to set up a great cell shot? Man, I can't, I can't speak. To get a site shell up and running with uh, Divi. Um, I honestly don't know of any specifically for that. Um, the best one would probably be as you open up Divi for the very first time and open up the builder, um, taking the tour and watching the video tour that Nick has in the documentation might be the very quickest uh, way to get up just a shell site uh, done like that to get it uh, usable um, and then importing uh, layout packs. But I don't know of any... Uh, specific ones. Uh, Uncle Social beat me to it here on uh, Mac having some uh, good videos about that. Um, yeah, his Elegant Themes uh, videos are great and his personal videos are great. Um, also, if you want to uh, just learn how to use Divi faster, not necessarily getting the site shell up and running with Divi initially, um, you can watch Jason and Donetta's live streams on Tuesday afternoon, and they uh, will sometimes show getting the site set up before they work on their uh, their particular use case. I know I learned a lot, learn a lot from, I shouldn't even say past tense, learn a lot from them doing that when they uh, do those on just how to use Divi uh, from an expert. Um but yeah, that is all the time I've got, you guys. I'm about to turn into a pumpkin, so I have got to get out of here. Uh, thank you so much for showing up. Thank you for uh, taking the time out of your day to talk to us, talk to each other, get to know one another, and uh, learn about Divi and WordPress and just internet culture uh, in general. Uh, thank you for being friends and uh, helping each other out in the comments. Uh, if you don't mind, please subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook if you're not. Uh, and you can also tell Facebook that you want to be notified whenever we go live. Uh, it does not do it automatically. The same for YouTube. Ring the bell and smash that like button. It really, really helps us be found. Uh, and shared with uh, people who uh, who need our content and uh, would would benefit from it. Uh, we really, 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 truly appreciate you uh, as as people, as customers, uh, as viewers. 
I hope that y'all stay safe this coming week. Uh, week. I hope that uh, you and your families are having a, uh, a safe time during this uh, during this pandemic. Uh, stay inside, folks. Be safe. Uh, don't shake anybody's hands and uh, wash your hands. I'll see you guys uh, next Friday at three. Bye, everyone.